Okay, and Max, are you ready? Three, two. Boy, am I ready. I'm feeling it. I've got that uh, special f- orange pill feeling. You know, it, uh, it's transformative. It's, uh, it, 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 it connects me. It connects me. I should not have brushed my teeth before trying this margarita here. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, is it like a chemical reaction? Yeah, in my mouth right now. It could be good in some ways if I think about it. I guess I would have to drop some more orange pills to see this as a good experience. It's not like putting Mentos into Coca-Cola, right? It's not going to explode. Well, I hope not. You know, like we totally never really genuinely know, I suppose. Jeez, you know, the risks are all around us. <laughs> right. So this is Sats Margs and Orange Pill. Thank you so much, everybody, for all your great feedback and artwork and things like that on our Telegram group this past week. It is the place to be. It's the place to become orange pilled, to become anti fragile, to find a community, to create a reality, to understand the reality disintegrating around us. And that's part of the reason why we need a new reality and need to have these conversations is because of the disintegration around us. We're being proactive. You know, in other words, the, uh, it's too late, right? The, the disintegration, depopulation, deglobalization, de-Chinification, de-dollarization, it's all happening now. The ship is sinking, and now it's about rebirthing. It's, it's not too late. It's just the right time. And before I get into the rubber chicken, Plucky, as he's known here, you know, this is an important part of our story today is I do want to say we're kind of recording in a different style because, you know, we did the microdosing orange pill this week and we used it on this camera and everybody loved this camera. So we're going to try this camera. It's not the iPhone cameras. I am also recording with those, but we're recording on this Logitech 4K here and hopefully you like it. I think it's pretty flattering. Uh, it looks, we look good. It sounds great. I wonder what it looks like. We look like supermodels in the actual. Uh, well, I used it, to be a foot model. No, you aren't. But speaking of foot models, I think Plucky could be one. And the reason why the rubber chicken Plucky is in the news, you know, he's part of the cause. He's in the Genesis block, right? Chancellor on brink of second bailout for bank. He's part of the whole, you know, treasury fed system of this fiat dark ages that have ruled the fiat dark ages and their time is coming to an end. But the reason I was so excited is there is an actual story that really interests me about censorship of the payments rail and how this is fixed by Bitcoin, of course. But the rubber chicken comes in because there's a company called Archie McPhee in Seattle. And they run the rubber chicken museum in Seattle and they sell weird stuff, including these things. Uh, Max won't be able to see it too well here because my printer has run out of color, but these are tardigrades. Right, they sell these things tardigrades. Tardigrades. This is the real tardigrade, and this is the toy one they sell. And I'm going to get into what tardigrades are because they're they're actually even kind of cooler, or perhaps in the same level of coolness as the honey badger. Okay, these right, are right. It's like the oldest living organism on planet yes. Earth. Yes, they've been around for 400 million years and indestructible. Like you could put them into outer space. You could deep freeze them for 30 years and then un- unfreeze them and they come back alive. Like pe- they come back as Peter Thiel. Yeah, yeah. Or Hal Finney. Maybe they're hanging out with Hal Finney right now. But this comes, they came into the news this week because not only did we discover a life on Venus, apparently, and one of the theories is it could be tardigrades in the atmosphere there that have, have created this, the biological um, footprint of life forms. Just as an FYI, That PayPal is currently blocking all transactions containing the word tardigrade and the product name or description. 
We've contacted them. They told us that we should stop using the word tardigrade. So remember, it's they're selling these uh, plastic little bright green tardigrades. Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that the U.S. Treasury, the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, OFAC, a few people mentioned OFAC sanctions. Somebody responded to them. So I investigated a bit more. In December of 2019, U.S. Department of Treasury sanctioned companies' links to Serbian arms dealer Slobodan Tesic, including Cyprus-based Tardigrade Limited. So PayPal flags Tardigrade ornaments by mistake. Right, yeah. This is about censoring the alphabet. I mean, you can put any random letters together and the kleptocrats can say this is censorship worthy and hence bitcoin enters the fray right so bitcoin is about censorship resistant money needed because the control of the payment system is in the hands of people who do not respect our civil and human rights well it's also like this can happen to anybody right now they actually managed to resolve this with paypal but PayPal itself, you know, most of our huge corporations are run on algorithm and the algorithm, they just enter in all the data that the treasury tells them of block these people. And it's hard to get off this list. You know, one thing you can compare it to is the no fly list that started under George W. Bush because of 9-11. And what you saw then is, you know, the equivalent Arab sounding or Muslim name that would be, say, Joe Smith in America, like one of these guys somewhere in the world was a bad dude. And everybody named Joe Smith in their in their language got banned from flying. Yeah, it's like uh, drag net fishing. You know that style of fishing where they drag a net on the floor of the ocean, and it just accumulates everything on the floor of the ocean. And then they only have maybe five or ten percent of what's in there they use as fish that they can sell. And the rest just gets destroyed. So here they're just drag netting the entire vocabulary and uh, censoring everything. And with the uh, idea that, well, if only 5 or 10% of the words or phrases or communication might be of interest to us in the law enforcement agencies, that's okay if we just destroy language as we know it. Yeah. And, but you can be cut off from the financial grid from being able to buy food, pay for shelter, anything, because, you know, so- Say there's a woman named Stacy Herbert who goes crazy somewhere. You know, by the way, that brings up, of course, there is there is a trend right now on Twitter of fake Bitcoin OG accounts. We have some, Adam Back has some, Elizabeth Stark. I've seen them all complaining. And it's been weeks and weeks, perhaps months, actually. Twitter used to be pretty good at taking them down after like five or six people send in a complaint. But dozens and dozens of people have already alerted Twitter to the fake Stacey Herbert asking for Bitcoin. The fact is, like, we'll never ask you for Bitcoin. If you receive a direct message from me on Telegram, if you receive a direct message from me on on Twitter, it's either like a fake by one letter or somebody's hacked my account. I'm not ever going to DM you and ask you for Bitcoin or or offer you some amazing investment advice that I'm not going to tell you right here, like publicly, everybody. I'm not going to do it exclusively to anybody. No, it's Plucky. Plucky's (laughs) impersonating you on Twitter to try to make a few extra sats. You know, he's a very mischievous chicken. Well, you didn't become the world's greatest economist just by, you know, acting straightforward and honest, you know. He achieved that status by being a crook. So let's talk about the tardigrade because I have some notes here. Before we move on to this whole censorship of the financial grid of the the monetary system by an empire whose own reality is disintegrating, as has happened to every single empire before it, by the way. So it's not like just picking on the American empire. The Spanish empire did it. The Roman empire did it. The Greek empire did it. Like the Mongolian empire, they all disintegrate in the same deranged way. But tardigrades are known colloquially as water bears or moss piglets, water-dwelling, eight-legged, segmented micro-animals and they're kind of like the honey badger because they are totally resilient. They, um, they're they known as the most one of the most resilient animals on Earth with individual species able to survive extreme conditions, such as exposure to extreme temperatures, extreme pressures, both high and low, air deprivation, radiation, dehydration, and starvation that would quickly co- kill most other known forms of life. Tardigrades have uh, survived exposure to outer space. So they survive for 10 days, 
full blast of the sun, the solar rays coming at it, no atmosphere to protect it. And about half of them survived in this experiment that they tried. Right. They're nearly indestructible form, life form. Yeah, it is like Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin has those same kind of attributes. It's virtually indestructible, immutable. It's, it's going to be around even if humans become extinct, both the tardigrade and Bitcoin will still be around. Yeah. But like the tardigrade, we should try to find a way, you know, to enter that into the whole Bitcoin lexicon is like, can, can a Bitcoiner survive? You know, can you survive all the parabolic moves up, the crashes down, the, the hubris that comes with um, feeling like you're Bitcoin, you came up with this. Like, can you survive Bitcoin? The problem with the tardigrade is that it's not very photogenic. Unlike the honey badger, which is, you know, kind of cute down there in Botswana, chasing animals and getting involved in all kind of mischievous situations, kind of a glorified skunk. You know, remember Pepe Le Pew was a very charming skunk. He went around chasing that little French cat. It was all very nice, you know, but a tardigrade looks, to be quite honest, it looks like a walking anus. I mean, I don't want to go back to, <laughs> is there know. life on your what anus? Is, what is but, it? But uh, it just so happens that the whole part of it's, organism that is imbibing nutrients, you know, it kind of looks like, a, you know, a sphincter. But OK, let's put that aside for a second. And just uh, I would say it, it only only a tardigrade's mother would find a tardigrade attractive. I get it. I get it. But you know what? This is a way to beautify the world. And, you know, HSBC is one of the biggest banks in the world, also one of the banks most involved in uh, criminal activity, whether it's rigging you know, precious metals markets or, you know, the laundering from Mexican drug cartels, creating special boxes in order for them to launder their money. And then, of course, getting away with it, unlike everybody else. Maybe Max will turn off that phone. That's what I'm doing. During this, I thought I might as well just turn direction. it off. You know, like that was my follow up to turning the ringer down off. Well, you know, there's nonstop calls from the fake IRS. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming it's the fake IRS. I tell them to bugger off and uh, hang up whenever they ask for some money or else they're going to take my social security number away. But as I was saying, HSBC, uh, Hong Kong Bank, Hong, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation out of uh, Hong Kong. And as you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, crackdown from China on Hong Kong and how they're targeting some of these people. Remember, all the protesters and activists were using cash to pay for their train tickets in order to avoid being surveyed because we do live in a financial surveillance state now. And what they... Um, what they're doing here is they started to advertise the local Hong Kong uh, Bitcoin community. And we went to one of their meetups. That's where we met Arthur Hayes. And they took out some uh, posters... This is really something and no corporate branding from what I hear, just straight up Bitcoin promotion. This is the way. And he's referring to Bitcoin advertising right here in the heart of Hong Kong's office district and right in front of HSBC's headquarters, be your own bank. So they're going, you know, they're, they're set. It's, it's like our propaganda. It's telling, it's telling people who have fallen into the propaganda of this dis disintegrating fiat dark ages that there isn't a way out. Like while we could put up these signs, we're going to tell you there is an alternative. You can be your own bank. You don't need to, you know, give your sovereignty over to HSBC and other crooks. Well, it's great to see that Bitcoin are stepping up and ponying up some cash and doing this kind of uh, PR. You know, Dan Held, big OG Bitcoiner, is always talking about Bitcoin's PR. I, I think this is probably it hasn't been stated as such, but at, probably in reaction somewhat, that there was a campaign in London on uh, subways and, and um, buses that was financed by one of these altcoins. And uh, typically, that's where you see a lot of the marketing is from the shitcoin community. So it's good to see Bitcoin finally kind of stepping up and saying, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just do the, all the marketing we need to do. We can do it. We're all rich. Let's do it. And somebody responded to that tweet from Jan Pritzker, but with saying what may not be obvious from a distance is that it's pitch perfect for an environment where people are having banking services suspended for political reasons. Couldn't be more timely or appropriate. So, you know, the, these headlines have shown you that you too can be Dresdened, right? You too can be slaughterhouse fived. You know, this is where... Everybody in Dresden during World War II and the Nazis, we all know, were despicable and horrible and stuff. But we, we just firebombed and carpet bombed and destroyed. We killed 100,000 people, right, in, in like 24 hours. 
and um, Kurt Vonnegut, of course, was famously a, uh, a prisoner of war in Dresden and, and only survived because he was in a slaughterhouse. That's where they were holding him. And he survived because of that. But like everybody, all civilians, you're collateral damage in this financial war of a disintegrating empire. And if, you know, everybody keeps on pointing at, at, to China as somehow uniquely authoritarian, and they are obviously a single party state and, and authoritarian, but they're wildly capitalist as well. But they are extreme with this sort of um, financial repression, financial restrictions, uh, that whole uh, social credit score. But we're going to show you that there, we're actually starting to institute the same exact thing. Totally. Exactly the same thing in our own way. But now you are kind of ringing the bell here and, and raising the sense of urgency for Bitcoin. Yes. And, yes. Right. So that the political pressures, the, the censorship resistant quality of Bitcoin is now of the most important it's been in the history of Bitcoin. The advertising in Hong Kong during a re repressive period in China and Hong Kong's history and a period when we've seen banks and payment rails censor payments to WikiLeaks, to Julian Assange, Defense Fund, uh, and other journalists around the world. It's the quality of the censorship resistant that is now coming to the fore, I think, more so than Orange Coin go up, right? Because it doesn't matter if you've got a lot of Orange Coin if you're in a gulag somewhere, if you're in a prison somewhere. So the fact that there's now need to be a coalition fighting politically, the political wing of Bitcoin is now taking shape. Yes, the censorship resistant part of it is like I'm saying is that you will be Dresden in some way somehow in this moment because as we move forward, because we have this huge force trying to censor reality, you know, left and right, they're all trying to censor reality because they don't understand how to message anymore. They don't know how to communicate anymore after decades in this bubble of their own um, delusion. They're just going to carpet bombing. They're going to carpet bombing, uh, which is deplatforming, mass deplatforming, and they're also, you know, uh, as the 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 authority of the empire disintegrates, and more and more nations around the world disobey Caesar. You know, Caesar gets very angry and starts lashing out, cutting off entire nations, like during Iraq when we cut off Iraq years ago. There were no alternatives, and 500,000 people starved to death there, mostly babies and children. Now, to put this into historical perspective, remember that Satoshi himself, in the notes that he made on the chat boards before he disappeared, there was this notion of, hey, let's help out WikiLeaks. Yes. And Satoshi said no, because he thought the political attention at that time might endanger the survival of Bitcoin. It was rejected by Satoshi. He felt that that kind of publicity so early in the game would be an existential threat to Bitcoin, did not think Bitcoin would survive that happening because it was still open to potentially a 51% attack. But what you're saying at this moment, and I would agree, is that we have to put Satoshi's words now aside. And understand that we are in a political battle of our lives as well as a financial battle for our lives. And that Bitcoin is uniquely suited to promote censorship-free exchange, interaction, and speech. Yes. Now, Satoshi birthed Bitcoin. This was his, her, or their baby. So just like a baby lion or tiger will one day be ferocious and powerful, a baby tiger or a lion still needs to be nurtured and protected. You know, you, you, you can't say, well, you know, in five years time, this is going to be a massive killing machine. Let's go throw it into the pit with other big lions now. Like you can't, you have to protect it, right? And if, if Bitcoin was birthed in order to separate the state from money, whether it wanted to or not, and obviously no state wants to be separated from money, and... So it made sense to make sure you're going to protect it from the state, the huge, giant financial surveillance state that we have. It's like those, uh, you know, old Roman and Greek stories about the future emperors. They run away and they're t nurtured and they grow up uh, on an island somewhere far away and then they become a man and then they go back and they conquer. Yes, so Bitcoin yes. Bitcoin is now a man. It's come back into the arena now to conquer and to do battle with the nation states. Yes. So that's why it's important. And now it's, it is censorship resistant from the state. In the early days, there were, it was still very much an experiment with great ambitions. And 
yes, you might want to have, if you have Alexander the Great and you might want to hide him as a baby if everybody knows, you know, his, um, the kings and emperors of the time know that there's a challenger. Uh, and yeah, it happened all the time that all the time children of a former emperor had to go into hiding to protect themselves from their uncle or whoever was ruling. Right. Or there's a conquest. And uh, so the child of the emperor that is destroyed in the conquest is spirited away and you know, he's searched and looked for and they try to kill him. And if he survives many times, they come back and they reconquer. So yes, Bitcoin is now of age. So we can now look as big to Bitcoin, like Mike Tyson coming back into the arena, you know, Bitcoin is coming back and it's going to do battle with the nation states. And that's the battle that we need right now because the nation states are really have, um, abandoned or abdicated, uh, any, any tie to being responsible, uh, being responsible in any way. Now, I think it's time to cut to a little video clip from your favorite, Madge Weinstein, and she talks about exactly these sort of issues of censorship and being censorship resistant because we do live in a cancel culture. We do live in a kind of idiocracy and, um, you know, scary times where there's authoritarianism and a memory holding coming from both you know, we only have a two a two way system, a right and a left, allegedly. You know, Democrat and Republican. So that's how we've organized the United States. Some areas have multi party systems across Europe and stuff like that. So I'm just referring to the United States, where we have two parties, and you have to basically choose either one. At this point, it's becoming very aggressive. But there's a lot of um, this cancel culture and authoritarian sort of deplatforming where they just want to t totally, completely memory hole and not just deplatform from social media, but deplatform from the banking system, from the utility grid. They, they don't want you to survive at all, never have a job again ever in your life. Even in 40 years time, you better not even try to get a job at McDonald's, let alone, you know, at a prestigious institution. Yeah, you you get um, like uh, what's the word excommunicated? Yes. Or the Romans, you would become um, banished, banished, exiled, exiled, and banished. You become exiled. Max, Stacy, there's something else I wanted to talk to you about that's a little more serious. It's about cancel culture, and it's in the news again because this wonderful progressive candidate named Alex Morse lost big time to this jack-off uh, Democratic centrist uh, monster named Richard Neal, who happens to be the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee that gives away all the fucking money. And he's also the number one campaign contributor receiver. He gets more money than fucking anybody else in Congress from corporations. That's the bottom line, Richard Neal. So this guy, Alex Morris, was, was trying to primary Neal and they ran a smear campaign against him, and they used cancel culture as sort of the as sort of the weapon against him. And they destroyed his candidacy, and he lost this week, uh, or last week, I guess, since this airs Tuesday. Whatever the fuck, it's the internet. I don't fucking know when this is. This could be 2080 for all I fucking know, or 2000 never. I could be in a fucking pig for all I. Anyway, that's that's not part of the story. <laughs> so. The problem with the way cancel culture is presented, it's as if it's a left-right issue. So the left people think cancel culture is fake and it's bullshit and, you know, it's just the right-wingers, you know, complaining that we're calling people out for being racist and the right-wingers think that it's just a bunch of left-winger crybabies and all this. But, you know, of course the truth is not binary like most other issues. Let's just start with what AOC said about it on Twitter. She said, people who are actually canceled don't get their thoughts published and amplified in major outlets. This has been a public service announcement. That was on July 9th, my sister's birthday, by the way. The term cancel culture comes from entitlement, as though the person complaining has the right to a large captive audience and one is a victim if people choose to tune them out. Odds are you're not actually canceled. You're just being challenged, held accountable, or unliked. That's what AOC says about cancel culture. Well, I'm sorry to say it. I love AOC. I agree with her when, mo when it comes to most matters of policy. But on this, she's absolutely full of shit. Totally wrong. I'll tell you something. I've been canceled myself, right? 
about 10 years ago, I lost a job. I was, I was on doing my podcast on Sirius Satellite Radio, Channel 102, for Adam Curry's pod show. I got a phone call from the other CEO, Ron Bloom, called me from a Starbucks, said, guess what, Madge? You're fired. Procter & Gamble won't sponsor you. That's, that's being canceled. I got canceled because this fucking company that makes all this fucking Windex didn't, wanna, didn't want anything controversial. That's a cancellation, okay? Also, you know what's happening now? Toxic screening of employees. Can you do me a favor and get the powder? I'm sweating too much. It's right there. Oh, sorry, Max and Stacy. I'm just schwitzing. I'm Jewish and I'm sweating. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, Max and Stacy. It's just hard being a woman. I don't know how the fuck any woman gets dressed by herself. No, sorry, Max and Stacy. Sorry about this. Fucking sweating. Jesus fuck. Oh my god. I just hate to have such a big file to send. Because then I run out of Dropbox space and we're all fucked. And then Stacy has too much to edit. Uh, fuck it. All right. So there's the there are these companies now. It used to be that when you would get uh, a job offer first, they would have it would be contingent on a background check, right? And the background check would be like Oh, first they have to check to see your credit rating. They have to check your employer, your employment background, and that sort of thing. Your previous jobs. Well, now there's companies like this Fama.io, right? This is a website where they screen people for toxic behavior when you before you get a job offer. And this this company Fama.io, you can Google it. The smartest way to screen toxic worst workplace behavior, toxic people. Now this term really bothers me because it kind of has sort of. A, Sounds a little bit like eugenics or maybe some Nazi Germany. I know you're not supposed to say Nazi. I'm Jewish. I can fucking say it. But, you know, when you're saying a person is toxic, what does that mean? You know, think about what that that word... I mean, you talk about uh, what words mean. and Toxic? Really? A person? A human being is toxic? That means they're poison. That means they can kill people. It's, it's a horrible word. So what happens is they take cancel culture, the idea of cancel culture, right? starts on Twitter and it infiltrates and you see people on TV getting canceled toxically for, for being toxic. And then, I, but, but that filters down. That, to, that idea that people shouldn't be toxic trickles down to everyone. And now these companies like Fama.io are, t- are checking everyone, including you. So when, next time you get a job, audience, somebody's going to screen you and there's going to be an AI that looks at all of your social media and it's going to analyze you and score you based on how toxic you are. Right. So Madge, I think, is right about this sort of, uh, this screening for toxicity, of course, (laughs) could happen to you if you apply for a job in the Bitcoin community and that's certain to get you hired. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, it refers back to what you were saying before. In, In China, they have the social credit score system. Yes. And everyone now has a social credit score. If you spit on the sidewalk, your score goes negative and then the cost of mortgages goes higher. You get deplatformed or you get, you can't, board an airplane, these, these types of, uh, of uh, privileges, as they're called, are be, become denied. So this is the American version of that. So the America is now fully mimicking China's, and let's, I, I mean, you got to call it an authoritarian system. And so America is becoming authoritarian. And I think that's sad, but it's also, um, it's also unmistakably true. Uh, the comments from AOC, I agree with Madge that um, she's trying to split hairs and make it sound like this cancel culture is not authoritarianism and to some degree, as Madge alluded to, neo-Nazism. But sadly, it, it, it is. And that's where Bitcoin can help because it's censorship resistant, it's immutable, and it's unconfiscatable. Right. And of course, what I think should happen because Twitter and Facebook are the two dominant, they control 95% of the social media space. And the fact is, like, you can mute or block as an individual. If you don't want to hear that person, you don't need to hear that person. You just mute or block them. So what these authoritarian from the left, especially at the moment, because they're out of power, as soon as you get into power, you're not as authoritarian uh, uh, on this sort of level about ideas. Woo! Woo! I'm so sorry. Now we both have COVID, so we're going to be locked down here for another 14 days at least. Well, it'd be no difference. 
<laughs> exactly. But so what I'm saying is that, you know, they're, they're shutting down ideas and, you know, they're, th these, there's a, a, a rush from the left to force corporations like Twitter to deplatform entirely, not allow these people to even have an audience, not give their censoring the ideas that can be transmitted to other people. So maybe somebody wants to hear about Bitcoin and maybe they decide that they don't want to, you know, maybe AOC decides she doesn't like Bitcoin and that this gives people too much uh, sovereignty from the state and that the state should only be able to issue money. So right, it's extremely self uh, dest destructive because the corporations that are doing this deplatforming are essentially disenfranchising their customers. You know, in any authoritarian country that goes crazy authoritarian, they end up murdering and killing their own citizens. And then they end up like, well, no one's here to farm anymore. No one's here to run the system anymore. And they implode because they, the corporations uh, are killing their customers. Uh, this is um, the, the Vietnam War strategy, right? We've got to burn the village to save the village. We've got to kill 58,000 servicemen so that uh, Bell helicopters can sell more helicopters. So this is the height of self-destructionism, narcissism. When, when an empire starts to look stare at itself in the mirror all day and nothing else, it starts to... Be, go insane, right? And so this is, you know, the American empire is collapsing, but Bitcoin is here for the rebirth. But like I say over and over, it's not unique. Like so many people, if you're a patriot and you feel like, oh, I love America and I love this flag and I love whatever we do, like, okay, step outside that, step outside America and look at the past, look at other uh, periods of time, even back in the 30s or 40s when Orwell was writing about and warning about authoritarianism and fascism coming. Okay, so just remove yourself. Pretend at all that it, you are not like your patriot to your nation state and the the leaders and elite plundering that nation state and you, therefore. So let's look at some of the signs of this sort of drive towards censorship. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Everybody knows that, right? How does it go? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> right? It's a foundational piece of Western music, okay? Right? So it's important. It's an important piece. Well, apparently, it's part of this possible deplatforming a memory holding thing going on. There, the, at least there's, you know, I think it's clickbait headline, but it always starts as clickbait and then becomes like a gulag. <laughs> the gulag is paved with clickbait. Well, okay. I, I could say that, like, because I'm friends with Madge. I know I'm not supposed to. I don't know. Who knows? Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is one of classical music's most famous works. But to many, it's also a symbol of elitism and exclusion. Okay, so apparently, yes, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony has been the popular is popular with white wealthy white men who embraced Beethoven and turned his symphony into a symbol of their superiority and importance. For others, women, LGBTQ People of color, Beethoven's symphony is predominantly a reminder of classical music's history of exclusion and elitism. Now, Beethoven is an artist, okay? Like, he creates art, and that is art. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is art. Whether or not the, you know, the New York Philharmonic or whatever decides to say, well, if you attend one of our operas or you attend a classical a uh, night of classical music and you have to wear a $20,000, $30,000 dress in order to get in. Well, they're the ones that did that. Like an artist is an artist and only has to respect his or her art. Right. I read the story and um, I guess I have a slightly different take on it. But so the comment there is contrasting Beethoven and uh, the Fifth Symphony with the work of Mozart. So Mar Mozart was very much in the music hall tradition and his audiences were very rowdy and he himself wrote uh, pieces with vulgar titles. He was a vulgar man. And some of the one was entitled something extremely vulgar. Uh, and it was very much of the, of the common theater and it was a, he was a very po populist artist, you could say, or uh, he was like a rock and roller, right? He was, a, he was the Bruce Springsteen of that century. 
But uh, so Beethoven comes around and his work is, um, it, it requires a stricter attention because the thematically it extends over the entire piece. Uh, that famous phrase at the top, da 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 da, is repeated throughout the piece and it transforms. And this is the life of Beethoven as he's going deaf, apparently. And uh, so it's more like a, lo- a, no- a novel, like War and Peace, writ musically. And um, so this attracted uh, more of a snob, a snobbery audience, a snobby audience. At the same time, the the concert experience became more refined. They built more. Um, the the uh, the concert halls had better um, um, acoustics, and uh, prices went up, no doubt. And uh, so it, it, it is, I can see how this has became, and, and this whole notion of polite society was introduced apparently around this time where the, the, the rich people are very quiet and polite and they dress a certain way. And the whole rowdiness of, of Mozart was left behind. And so this is the beginning of, a, of, a, uh, of, a, of an elitist approach to art, which we still see in the pages of the New York Times, for example. They try to be gatekeepers in terms of what is really art and what is not. You, you must read the New York Times to understand that. But on the other hand, I, I understand that the art itself is, 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 as art, stands alone, regardless of what who is listening or who the gatekeepers are trying to um, understand about it. It's very similar to what's going on in Bitcoin right now. Uh, there are discussions about Bitcoin's gatekeepers and purity tests. Yes, and yes. There, people are saying, um, do uh, is there a max? Are maximalists in the Bitcoin space being gatekeepers and applying these random purity tests? And so it's similar in that this is a Beethoven esque moment where suddenly it's uh, a split in the, in the culture. And, uh, you know, but the ba- but but Bitcoin, like Beethoven, doesn't give a shit. Right. <laughs> it Beethoven was on that vector toward immortality the second he wrote the chords, you know, those those notes and never looked back and never looked around. He was just on his own vector to immortality. Similarly, with Bitcoin, it's on its own vector, you know, where it's pointing. Nobody actually knows. Is it toward the North Star? No, that's from Magellan's days. Those are hundreds of years ago that the North Star is the guiding star. Is it to the moon? Not really. That's We've already been to the moon. But that's not even a, a very, that's not much of a challenge, is it? Is it to another planet? Is it to another galaxy? Where is it pointing? Where is Bitcoin pointing us to? And this is still an unknown I feel I have an appreciation about it because it's been something I've been thinking metaphysically and philosophically now for 40, 50 years. Uh, So I and I try to share these thoughts whenever I can. But the 99.99999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
I'm excited, Max and Stacey, because now we're taking our orange pills, we can take off human civilization's training wheels and really go places. The sun produces 384 trillion terawatt hours of electricity a year. Now, planet Earth consumes 20,000 terawatt hours of electricity a year. So we've got this giant nuclear fusion reactor floating around in space that we can harness whenever we wish. Now, harnessing it with a solar photovoltaic panel is in essence passive nuclear fusion energy. So we've already harnessing nuclear fusion energy down here on the planet's surface. But when we do so, it has limitations. As we know, the planet rotates, so you can only harness sunlight for at least half a day. And even then you've got clouds to deal with. So what happens then if you were to launch your solar panels into outer space? You can then start harnessing solar power 24 hours a day and then beaming it down to Earth using either microwave radiation or via laser beam. And you can send that power to wherever it was acquired any time of day. Now there is a grading system for galactic civilizations called the Kardashev scale. Now a type one civilization in the Kardashev scale is when a civilization can harness the power output from the entire planet. And we're not even close to doing that. So we haven't even yet become a type one civilization. Now, when we get to be able to harness the entire power of the sun, only then are we a type two civilization. But these technologies are now already being developed. Both the Japanese and the American military are already trialing microwave space-based solar photovoltaics, where we're able to harness solar power and beam it down to earth, harnessing that giant nuclear fusion reactor and turning it into energy, which we can utilize to do whatever we want with here on earth with zero environmental impact beyond the production of those solar panels in the first place. Now, if you're interested in the environmental impact of manufacturing solar panels, do check out a previous snippet where we discussed that at length. So that's it for this time. I think you'll find that we are progressing a civilization. So keep taking those orange pills, guys. Right. So we're all going to get to that higher type one civilization soon on our way to type two. Right. And it's all about energy. You know, people say what backs Bitcoin? The answer is energy. As Abe says and others, everything everywhere is backed by energy. Energy is the primary commodity of the multiverse that we're all living in. Bitcoin converts energy into hard money in a way that's very, very efficient and getting more and more efficient. So what Abe Cambridge is doing at the Sun Exchange is making the conversion of energy into Bitcoin ever more efficient. And it changes the entire energy grid. You notice that the big energy companies, Exxon and others, their stocks are trading down. Uh, price of oil is trading down because we are leaving the era of petroleum-based energy source as the primary uh, driver of the 20th century, 21st century economies. Remember, we transitioned a hundred and something years ago from whale oil mm. to uh, petroleum uh, that was found originally in Pennsylvania, uh, then Okay, that was the beginning of the oil era. Before that was wood and coal. Right. So now we're entering that era. We're entering a new era. This new era looks like it's going to be sunlight. Sunlight will become the dominant source of energy. And Bitcoin is, is helping us bridge as a civilization to that new reality by creating a, a way to fund it, by, by understanding it via this hard money called Bitcoin, which organizes not only our economy, but the way we think. And it might rescue humans as we know it, this earth that we know it, people living on this planet. Because as I pointed out, you know, this all came about because we were looking for extraterrestrial life. So the fact that we're type zero, we're not even type one, we're not love at the first level of civilization means we're not going to be found either. So if, if, if we need to be rescued, like... No, no aliens are going to find us. Right. I mean, the reference to the search for extraterrestrial life, if you, I think you're referring back to the 90s and the SETI project, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which was one of the first and, and enormous use of network computers. Yeah. So get people would volunteer their computers to go out there and search for radio waves. And of course, Bitcoin, to some degree, borrows from that technology by having this huge network that is contributing to the hash. Well, it was the Kardashev scale was invented in 1964, I think it was. So it was like astronomers and physicists were already knew there were galaxies and a huge universe out there. So they 
of course, wondered, like, are there other life forms out there? As we point our telescopes that are increasingly powerful out there, what do we look for? Like, how do we identify from these little blips out there? And sure, we as uh, astronomers and physicists can see more than other people with our tools. But like, what would be a sign that we could see at this level of technology? What are the signs that there's other life forms out there and civilizations? So they look at energy use on that planet if they're able to absorb if they could see them absorbing the energy and uh, using it. So that's what I'm saying is like the more we use Bitcoin and the higher this hash rate goes and it's going higher and higher is like we might finally be rescued. Yeah, that's, or, that's or my point. That's my point. <laughs> that Bitcoin is an SOS yeah. to the multiverse to rescue us. That's in, in a nutshell what, what this whole project is about. It's not really about money. It's not really about anything but humans sending out an SOS to the multiverse help us. And, you know, I was going to go to one more headline. Well, I guess I'll do it quickly before we throw to our interview with Obi Nwosu, who is at coinfloor.co.uk, a great service to dollar cost average or pound cost average into Bitcoin in the United Kingdom for those in the United Kingdom. Actually, I think they offer the services for most parts of the world, including Europe and possibly Latin America or Africa. Well, we'll see in this interview. But first, I want to quickly uh, point out that in the New York Times, you know, one of these, the elite institutions that have been now uh, tasked with determining fake news for social media, they're hired by the likes of Facebook to do to read um, anything you post and decide whether or not you're posting fake news. Well, they published a fake news piece. And this is why it's important to just always, always question everything you watch. If you're a Republican and like watching Fox, watch Fox, but watch other alternative takes on that same story that you're, you're watching because you don't, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, you don't want to be like caught. You don't want to be, that, that makes you fragile. So to Mm -hmm. not be open to other interpretations. It just leaves you fragile. But here we see this is a straight news piece, not opinion in the New York Times. As far as I understand, the expert consensus is that a lack of controlled burns over many decades in California is in fact the primary and direct cause of the severity of these fires wiping out huge sways of the the state. This is not even gestured at in this story. So the New York Times ran a piece Talking about, like President Trump, conservative media stars dismiss climate change, which scientists say is the primary cause of the conflagration of the the fires happening in in California and point to the poor management of forest land by local and conveniently Democratic officials. So they're saying that the, the actual truth is a fringe idea. And our truth, which, you know, I know there's a lot of climate change deniers and that drives uh, those of us who who can understand that it's happening crazy, but creating like your own fake news and your own fake reality doesn't um, help anybody. Right. There's this idea that you can be bigger than nature, bigger than the market, bigger than the multiverse. And it's a hubristic tendency of all humans. And as they get more power, they become more powerfully deranged. And we're seeing this played out currently. And um, where it ends is a reversion to the mean or a catastrophe or a tragedy, right? The Greek dramatists were very good at putting forward these tragedies of human nature where things happen in a recurring cycle of ego manifestation, et cetera. And that's, that's the point that we're at. And um, there is another counter story happening. It is the Bitcoin story. It is uh, sent to us in, at an opportune moment in our history as humans. And it is the SOS to the multiverse to get us out of these restrictions, choreographed by the New York Times, music by you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber, <laughs> and uh, staged by um, Tricky Dick Nixon, and um, starring the inevitable uh, lightweights, Rachel Maddow, and um, a whole cast of wannabe celebrities like Matt Lauer. Right. So here, before we go to our interview with Obi, I want to show you before we go, we want to like, we'd like to push some uh, artwork being created. We love art. Like we're not going to deplatform the art. 
we're, we're publishing and posting and promoting the art. And this is from Bit Paint, Bit Paint Club. He's known as, I, I believe it's a he, it could be a she, uh, on, on Twitter. And that's uh, this one with Max and Stacy doing our mini in Moskowitz, you know, the John Cassavetes film where we're each upside down. I love it. It's one of my favorite films ever. It might be politically incorrect these days, but nevertheless, that's our art for this week. And now it's time to go to our interview this week, Obi Nwosu from coinfloor.co.uk forward slash max. Right. So we are here, Max, with Obi Nwosu of coinfloor.co.uk. Obi, welcome to Orange Pill Podcast. Thank you for having me again, guys. <laughs> right. So <laughs> in this first segment, before you arrived here on the show, we've been talking about censorship resistant nature of Bitcoin in relation to financial transactions and the importance of this as deglobalization accelerates, in our opinion due to the Thucydides trap happening between the U.S. and China. Like, for example, we've seen this past week, uh, TikTok, obviously, is getting banned in the United States. It seems like, you know, corporate jealousy in a way to me and, you know, perhaps some espionage. But as this Thucydides trap heats up between the U.S. and China, do you agree that there is a growing urgency for a censorship-resistant financial system and your thoughts on the actual censorship resistant nature of Bitcoin itself? Yeah, well, I, first of all, yes, definitely. There is a requirement for a censorship resistant financial system. But, um, and Bitcoin is the only option in town. And why? Because Bitcoin at its heart is a community. We're very cryptocurrency, it's a community. And the Bitcoin community has a culture of censorship resistance. That's what makes it powerful. At the end of the day, everything else about it can be changed. If there's a bug in the code, it can be fixed. If you wanted to, you could inflate the, um, the market cap, the number of Bitcoins available from 21 million to 21 billion um, and everything in between. But because the culture of the community ejects anybody who has a view against the basic philosophy of being your own bank, censorship resistance, the power of the person. Um, that's what gives you the confidence. That's what you want in the crypto, in a, the new form, the next hegemony in terms of um, world crypto, world currency. Um, there are concerns though. There are definite concerns because money doesn't exist in a bubble. And I do have a worry that um, the nation states that we are starting to live in are becoming ever more draconian themselves. They're becoming like panopticons. And so if you are not, if everything you see and touch, do and hear is being recorded and tracked, in, in, including your expenditure of money, then even if your money is censorship resistant, your ability to move and expend that may be um, affected. So on the, the counter to that is you're seeing the movement of some people to other jurisdictions. You're seeing movements to where they are, they have more respect for privacy and so on. And that trend to move away or exit from certain places with draconian tax policies, with draconian censorship policies, if you are able to and you are, and are, are capable of, is going to increase as well. Right. Panopticon. Great word. It's not used often enough. So to follow up on this idea of the states becoming more invasive, more powerful, the surveillance increasing, there's this phrase, this idea, this concept in Bitcoin that it separates state from money. Really, for the first time in history, we've seen such a clean break of state from money with Bitcoin. Is this going to be an adequate way to fend off this invasive state? And was Bitcoin to some degree conceived as an anecdote to a trend that was already in place? Or is it a reaction to that trend? As an anecdote to a trend that was already in place, or is it a reaction to that trend? Um, I, don't, I don't know, is, to be honest. I don't know which one it is. But um, I, don't, I think Bitcoin was, was the savior that we needed, but not the one we necessarily deserved. So there are some there are some challenges to Bitcoin. It's as a community, it can be very very rough around the edges. Um, 
but I believe that to fix this system, to provide an alternative, you have to be the, the grumpy uncle, you have to be the black sheep, you have to be, an, and, I, and we don't need to rename black sheep to something else, um, but, <laughs> but uh, you, have to, you have to be um, out of the ordinary and difficult and cantankerous to be able to actually be to fix this system because if you if you are if you are compatible with everybody else you're going to you're going to be sucked under so my view is that bitcoin is a solution to our current problems but i'm not sure how i to be honest i'm not sure why it was why it was present but it is solving a problem and and it's striking a nerve and people are seeing that and reacting to that and and that for me it makes me incredibly excited about its potential right well let's uh, move on to another area of the world where things are a little bit different so the entire continent of africa is censored simply because of the structure of the current fiat settlement layer as few if any us banks are willing to bother with kyc aml paperwork for the region uh, furthermore, dollars are in short supply globally, even in the allied central bank system like Europe. So let's discuss Bitcoin already being used as a settlement layer in places like Nigeria, where there is a lot of trade with China and Japan. How might their fiat disadvantages actually lead to a post-fiat first mover advantage in using Bitcoin as a unit of account? Well, um, I was just talking to someone the other day. I can give you a, a simple example. Um, when I, a couple of years ago, unfortunately, I had to, for very unfortunate reasons, I had to go back to Nigeria. And um, the reason why was my mother was was very unwell. She suffered a stroke. And in Nigeria, which was not in the middle of the countryside in Nigeria, um, which was not the best place in the world to suffer a stroke, unfortunately, uh, my my brother and I managed to see her um, um, before she passed away, so we were very glad we managed to do that. Um, but we went there and we had to pay in cash because it's still um, there's a phrase credit or cash, you know, and it's still a very much a cash economy, and we had to pay in cash for doctors and hospitals and various things. So we flew to Nigeria. Um, I won't even tell you the trials it took to get from the airport to the middle of um, the countryside in Nigeria, but we got there and we had to just change money. Now in, in the UK, that process, and we had to, and, and, and then they had to take that money and import a certain number of medicines and, and items. So this in the West is a very, very simple process. You know, you would, first of all, everything is available on tap. You would, you would use Apple Pay, Google Pay, wibble wobble pay whatever it is and you'd get it in a moment if it's in another currency it's automatically converted nigeria involved me coming with um a a bag of cash i then had to go to a money changer that money changer process is an incredibly fraught dangerous process you're going to these dark streets no public lighting you meet a random person you don't know if they're going to take you where they're taking you to because you, you can't change money in the middle of the streets. And then finally, you, you're in a small backroom um, um, office and you give them your money and you're waiting, are you gonna be beaten up or are you gonna get money and replacement? And you're, and you're replaced with a bag full of cash because of the exchange rate is, is so terrible. Um, when I was young, when I was in my um, under 10 years old in the early eighties, one Naira used to be a roughly equivalent to one pound and it, you, it was more than one dollar now the official exchange rate is nearly 400 naira to the dollar and the unofficial the real exchange rate is more like 500 naira to the dollar and it's and and that's when in the same period of time the dollar's lost what 90 percent against gold so against gold naira it's it's just it's just crazy so we exchange this bag full of cash in this very dangerous environment the whole process not to mention it's Nigeria, so there's lots of negotiation, half an hour at least of a negotiation for anything. And so there's a two hour process. Then you have to disseminate it with multiple parties. They pay massive overheads and costs for paying for buying things in cash. They have to then find someone who's going to be importing this thing, paying in cash, whatever it is you want. And because it's cash, and because only a few people can do this, they pay massive markups again. Now, 
in a Bitcoin world, and you're starting to see this, and, and people I know in the, in, the, in the Nigerian space are doing this, they can provide goods and services in Bitcoin, receive Bitcoin from the diaspora directly with a mobile because mobile penetration is amazing. Mobile uh, landline phone penetration is terrible. Some, some cities have literally only hundreds of thousands of landlines, but almost everyone has a mobile phone. And then they can pay their suppliers in, in China or wherever it may be for their goods or services. And those suppliers may be uncomfortable receiving money from a, a Nigerian um, customer paid on a credit card because they'd be worried that something's going to happen to the card. It's going to be a chargeback or so on. But because they're receiving a bearer asset, they no longer need to care who the customer is. They, Bitcoin is worth the value of Bitcoin. And so they can now transact and receive that on the same basis as someone in the West. It's a completely different world and the power and, the, and they cut out multiple middlemen. And that's why inevitably people understand this. They understand the store of value secondarily, but they, first of all, they understand the utility of being able to import. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think the fact that they are, they do have so many hurdles in the fiat structure of the US dollar world to entry, you know, the barriers to entry are huge. I think it advantages them that, you know, you see that often with technology is that you haven't sunk all these costs into building, you know, dial up cables and the person, the nation that doesn't have that, and they get to put the broadband in without having to deal with the cost of the previous infrastructure. So I, I think that's an advantage. But I also want to look at this in terms of, of peace and justice, because one thing that you think of when uh, that Westerners, they'll often think of Africa as a place that we need to send um, aid, foreign aid. And th that entails, um, you know, agitating your government to tax the citizens to send more money there, when it seems that Africa itself is hugely resource rich. I mean, y the, everything our, all of our high tech stuff, we're only able to communicate right now because of Africa and and the resources that they have. But like, w w what about uh, Bitcoin and the settlement layer and this ability for them, therefore, to trade freely and fairly? Not only um, that Bitcoin is is permissionless and and like doesn't discriminate, but that it then gives. Uh, all the entrepreneurs, it's a really entrepreneurial economy all across and most of the nations of Africa that, you know, they have, you know, as equal chance as anybody in London of participating in the, e in the global economy. Do you, do you see Bitcoin as a way out of this paradigm that we're in stuck in this fiat paradigm? Yeah, it's, it's not only that it, it allows to um, upend a number of assumptions about how economies advance. There's normally the assumption you start this arable economy, you're farming the land, and then you go on to manufacturing like China did. And you, you go through this process. And from there, you go into tertiary um, services and a service-based economy. And then finally, you go to this high-tech economy. And you have this sort of pecking order. And you must go from A to B to C to D. But actually, the most high value, um, everybody wants to be at the top of the tree. That's where they want to get to. And everybody's taught that they have to go through these step one, two, and three. But what's interesting is that the high tech economy, which are the most, the, the, the most wealthiest parts of the world and not just countries, cities and states. So if you take London or New York or Liechtenstein or, or, um, or um, Switzerland, they are powered by either technology or finance. And everybody wants to be at the top. And so to be at the top now, it doesn't involve greater expenditure expenditure for the first time, the top um, most well-paid, most lucrative industries and professions have the ability to um, generate revenue and, and generate amazing returns with just the ability to have an internet connection and a computer. And, big, and, and Africa as a continent, Africa's greatest resource is its human capital. And that's only going to grow over the next 30 years over half of, there's going to be two, the, the estimate is going to be, I believe, 2.2 um, billion pe new people will be on this planet over the next 30 years. And more than half of those, I think it's something like 1.3 billion of those will be from Africa. Nigeria alone will go from 190 
a million people to 400 million people. And so it's all of these young, and well, at the same time, by official numbers, um, the Chinese economy is going to, the Chinese population is going to reduce in that period of time. By the end of the century, um, Nigeria will be the second largest, um, second largest um, in terms of population country in the world. So all of these young, bright entrepreneurial minds who have access to directly skipping, they're not going to want to make money by going to a factory or, and, and, or, or plowing the land and, and following the, the type. They're just going to get their mobile phone and their internet connection and their VR headsets and basically provide a service to anyone anywhere in the world. And they provide the highest value services, programming, development, financial services, whatever that may be. And I, I do want to say, like, we've watched documentaries about there, and it's, like, amazing, the whole creative community, like uh, Nollywood and also the, the, the music industry there is, like, massive, like, unheard of outside of Nigeria, but massive there, like, deep penetration of these local, local, very small, um, you know, rap and music groups and, uh, you know, pr publishers and, and, uh, and Nollywood producers. It's remarkable to see, but... With that, we're going to take an ad break right now because, you know, we've got to pay for our show too. Sun Exchange is the world's first peer-to-peer -peer solar leasing platform. Earn Bitcoin solar power in communities in Africa and be part of the new world economy. Visit thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill and start monetizing sunshine today. Right. So uh, the internet and Bitcoin levels the playing field and uh, the margins on those creative industries are a lot higher. And so... Mm -hmm this youthful Nigerian population can leapfrog right into those high margin creative industries right from the get go and uh, support lots and lots of entrepreneurialism. And that's what we're seeing right now. Kind of want to follow up on that a little bit and talk about the egalitarian nature of Bitcoin and how it relates to online identity. So right now, when you're moving around the world, you've got your passport first. Uh, in terms of freedom to travel, trade, et cetera. And then factors like skin color, gender, other traits uh, come into play and it all creates uh, uh, biases. And these biases have a tendency to create friction. And that friction is usually anti entrepreneurial in many ways. How does Bitcoin level the playing field in this area of online identity? Well, at the end of the day with Bitcoin, as, we, and as people are seeing in Nigeria, but I'm sure the same thing is happening all across Africa, but I can speak definitely directly to Nigeria. Um, Bitcoin people as a, as a merchant are only interested in the color of your money. And when you are giving someone a bearer asset, all of a sudden it's, it's a digital gold, I can receive that money and now all of a sudden I, my bias is about, are you going to be good credit or so on, go away. And that is a big set of concerns that many, um, many credit cards, many providers do not support certain countries in Africa. Um, many merchants will not interact with Africa. But if, if I now um, ask the, as the customer who wants access to, to um, a, a good or service for my business, but be able to cut out middlemen, get it at a better price, a better quality, um, I'm willing to take that risk because I know that this, this provider is a good quality provider. And I, and I will pay them the money and they will now receive that and, and deliver me the good. All of a sudden I've re removed, from their point of view, it's, it's reduced their risk and they've sent me the item. And from my point of view, I'm in a different world. I am now on a level playing field with competition who I'm willing to work five times harder than them at, at one fifth of the cost. I'm going to destroy them any day of the week. Right. So philosophically, once we get, remove these biases, is it opening up an interesting field to play where people can abandon their identities as the government has given them in their communities and explore their true selves in a, this new environment. And what does that do philosophically? And where are we going with that? And how does Bitcoin enable this? Yeah, well, uh, I think it's no secret that I have a, a real great interest in 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 identity and, and our obsession with identity and moving past that, a post-identity world. Um, and so it's both, um, I think that where we're going ultimately, well, we actually have a choice. We either go into hyper-identity and then you're in this sort of 
I think, a very, very, very scary 1984 like world. Um, or you go into a post identity where we have the ability to wear identities like we wear clothes. Now, um, the forefront of this will not be the, the physical nation states. It will be the sort of the, the, the digital trans nation states. The one, the scariest, the, the, um, the, um, the scariest of these is Facebook. They just this week announced their new um, Oculus um, um, VR headset. They also announced Horizon and their security mechanisms, which allow them at any point to eavesdrop on any conversation happening there. And their thing called Infinite Office, which is their, their approach and their, their, um, their objective of getting people to work, not just play, but work and socialize. So they run their whole businesses within VR, in VR environments. But you must sign up to Facebook's terms and conditions, which allow them at any point to view everything you're doing, anybody you're talking to, any reaction you have. So imagine you're working and having a private conversation with, in a meeting room, but it's in this Facebook world. And their stated objective is to get a billion people online in VR, working all day long, um, interacting all day long, socializing and playing in VR. Wait, that now, is isn't, the Matrix, isn't it? Isn't that the plot of the Matrix movie? <laughs> it's the plot of the Matrix movie mid, mixed with Ready Player One, um, mixed with everything else in and Neuromancer and everything else in between. And this is their stated objective. They've, and, and all of these statements and theories have been materialized two days ago. I think that the, uh, they had a conference, uh, Facebook Connect, and it's gonna go down as being as seminal, the announcements there, I think in history as, as the announcement of Steve Jobs and the original iPhone. This is, that was the iPhone moment for VR two days ago. And, but the scary thing is they've insisted that you must sign up to the Facebook's terms and conditions, which gives them carte blanche to be able to view to a, a level that makes makes North Korea look like kumbaya, um, what you do. So that's one path. The other path, um, and you know, I'm going to be at an event next um, next week, um, um, magical crypto conference, and I, I believe you guys are as well. So are you guys, <laughs> yeah. and they, on the other hand, are using another example, which is Mozilla Hubs, which is completely open source. It's a decentralized VR, and that's the beginnings of the decentralized alternative. So whereas um, um, Facebook is from an identity point of view, and they have a, a real identity policy, Facebook, you are not allowed to have a false identity with Facebook. You must use a real identity when you're online. And this is where if you're attaching a real identity to an environment where they can view and track everything you use, the technology is exciting, but the, 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 the effect for identity is incredibly frightening. The problem with Facebook, um, is that, and it, they're, they're a private organization, they need to make money. And the devices that they are building are actually amazing. Everybody who's reviewed them, and I'm a geek for this stuff, um, states and confirm that this is groundbreaking. And they're also selling it probably at a massive loss. From a hardware point of view, they're selling it for $300 when um, most people believe that it should be sold for a thousand. How are they? How are they monetizing this? How are they getting their money back? Because they are, they are selling it, and they're getting from you your identity. They, you are, you are giving them. You're paying in your identity. And I think what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to let them let this run for a while because we need them to innovate and bit great, in, incredible technology and bring the price down. But ultimately, in the same way we saw it with operating systems, with Linux um, ultimately taking over as the, the number one operating system, um, and on the mobile phone with Android happening again, and, and now with money, with um, Bitcoin ultimately be going to become the new hegemony taking over these centralized monies, we're going to need a centralized version of this because nation states do not be, be very clear about this. Physical nation states, we will spend some time living in those, but over time, we are going to spend less and less time interacting in the physical nation states. Facebook understands this, and it's the virtual nation states. And in the virtual nation states, the corporate is king. And if you think about, um, if you think about Facebook as a nation state, it's really scary, a trans nation state. 2.7 billion people run by one person who has a track record of not caring about people's identity and it with a 58% ownership of that. 
it makes it makes North Korea look literally like Kumbaya, as I said. Right. Well said. Now, uh, big news in Bitcoin space this past week. We've seen an S and P five hundred company recently convert a significant portion, like hundreds of millions of dollars, of their treasury from dollars into Bitcoin. Do you see this spreading to other companies and even to the nation state level? Yeah. So. It was already happening before that. I, I, I wrote about MicroStrategies, their first investment a few weeks back uh, for uh, BC Times. And um, I, the reason why I wrote about it is because we've had a number of UK-based companies, um, I can't say who, but large UK-based companies, some of them a few years ago, who had nothing to do with the crypto space, the, fin- the, the finance space, were purely retail industry but they were known brands high street retail brands decided to put some of their treasury expenditure into bitcoin and they've done very well they did it a few years ago when bitcoin was at the sort of three four hundred pounds mark um and so you're you're starting to see that but what it didn't really click how significant it was until micro strategies not i i, I listened to micro strategies investments but i also listened to um, um, the um, CEO of MicroStrategy talk about his reasons. And again, just like nation, just like um, when it comes to nation states, the future of nation states is the corporate. The future of um, investment we need to be concerned about is not what's happening in banks and central banks and will they invest into Bitcoin. It's what's going to happen to the real people, movers and shakers of the economies, corporates. What are they going to do? And from their point of view, it makes perfect sense when you finally hear it from someone like like the, the CEO of MicroStrategies. It makes perfect sense that more will do this. And that's going to be where we need to look at for the movers and shakers and not wait for central banks to finally get it in, in 50 years time. And of course, the corporates you're in the United Kingdom are many of them are fleeing the city as you head into this Brexit, possibly, who knows what's going on with this thing, right? And that is causing turmoil on the pound. So again, that brings it back to Bitcoin is like, you might even be cut out of some of these common markets that (laughs) you had long been part of as the United Kingdom. And now, you know, it might become difficult. Who knows? Who knows? Because we also have the Thucydides trap on top of this and weird stuff happening geopolitically. So final thoughts before we head away on that in terms of Brexit in the UK, uniquely for the UK right now and Bitcoin. Um, so Brexit and the UK. To be honest, I, like many people, um, I, 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 I predicted the... Um, at the beginning of this year when the the pandemic happened and saw saw various different countries responses that my prediction was the two countries that are going to be that are going to come out worst from this in the western world were going to be united states and united kingdom and now we're coming close to the end of the year i i think i'm 100 percent right it's going to be united states (laughs) And you know, I mean, there's going to be places in in South America and so on, Brazil, etc. But in the Western world, it's going to be those two. Now, as someone who grew up in the, in the United Kingdom, it's it pains me. But I see many of my um, um, colleagues moving to other countries. We're now, you know, mostly remote, and and a lot of the team are moving remotely. And I even have to I even have to admit that I'm considering that as well. Um, but as I said, what encourages me is the, is the view that where you stay physically is less and less important. And, and I think United Kingdom is going to have a rude awakening when they realize, when people, when they finally figure out that you need to compete more and more, not with other countries, but with, other, with, with companies. And, and when, when, a, when a bureaucratic nation state has to compete with an entrepreneurial country, company, I don't give, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't expect they're going to do well in terms of the competition. Right. Well, these market caps for companies like Amazon at over two trillion or Apple at over two trillion, that's now getting over the market or the GDP of Great Britain. So, yeah, they are in fact competing. 
Yeah. And also, I might say that it's going back to how it used to be before nation states arrived and started messing up everything for the individual, because individuals used to be quite free to travel and go wherever was the best ruler and the best economy and best uh, lifestyle. Then capital became the thing that became free and individuals got stuck behind their borders. Now, like we we could see a post nation state world and a pro Bitcoin freedom world where we get to move around and just, even if it means putting on some goggles and like exiting this system and going into another virtual. Does Bitcoin promote peace and justice? I, I'm not sure if it does. I, I don't think it has this moralistic element to it. Um, it, it promotes, um, and this word has been used incorrectly. Um, so it pro promotes true meritocracy as opposed to false meritocracy. Um, and, but in a true meritocracy, um, and I, I think it promotes freedom as well, but freedom has a, is a double-edged sword. Meritocracy is a double-edged sword because if you're not good at what you do, if you're crap at what you do, you're going to be disadvantaged. And a lot of people who are not good at what they do, who don't realize they're not good at what they do, um, we have to deal with them every single day. And there was this tweet recently about um, smart, dumb people. And I commented on it, is that the only people who are as dumb as smart, dumb people, i.e. people who appear smart but are actually dumb, are the people who are convinced by smart, dumb people. And there are a lot of smart, dumb people out there who really believe they're clever and, and they're, they're as thick as two planks. They are going to have a very rude awakening and they're not going to be happy about that. And they're well-resourced. And when 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 the wounded lion is finally um, um, realizes the, the realizes the um, has a mirror put up in front of their face, that that becomes quite they could become quite violent. So I am really excited about what's happened, what what where we're, where we're moving to. But I'm also scared because you have to be ready for the fight. You have to be ready to defend yourself, um, and because it's going to get you know it's the may we live in interesting times, but. That that was actually supposed to be a curse, you know, and and that also and that also means that this is going to be potentially a more dangerous world, um, but it will be a more freer world. And I think just like the Matrix, I'm going to go for the well, the orange pill every yeah, single time. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, orange yeah. pill, baby. Let's wrap it up. This whole yeah. thing was to get me to say orange pill, wasn't it? <laughs> finally, it took it forty minutes. Yeah, but said that right at the there. beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the Orange Pill, Ovi. This is great. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Right. Well, that was Obi Nwosu, a friend of Orange Pill. He's been Orange Pilled himself, obviously, ready for Type 1 Civilization Max. Awesome interview. Awesome guy. Awesome product. Coinfloor.co.uk. And I just love listening to Obi. You know, he's got, uh, he, he's singing, you know, from the heart. And it's uh, just joyous. Well, you know, once somebody knows Bitcoin, like, it, it, it takes a few stages to get to that Bitcoin nirvana. Like, you know, the first thing is owning a Satoshi. Just, just one Satoshi. Everybody has one penny, right? You own a Satoshi. And then it, it, for some people, enlightenment happens within a week, maybe even an hour. But for others, you know, it might take a few years of, of hanging out with a Satoshi and having a Satoshi of your own and what it does to your mind and how you view the world and basic principles of natural law, like what we're seeing right now and experiencing with censorship resistance or the 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 principles of, of, of having the right to privacy or free speech, uh, freedom of religion, separation of money and state and things like this. So this is what he has obviously achieved. He's, he's near Nirvana. Definitely. You know, you feel it. He just, um, everything about him, you know, and his, his posture, his, uh, voice, his, uh, word choices, the, the way he speaks, the inflection, the actual content, it's just like one long, beautiful phrase underscoring the magical properties of the orange coin. Well, that's kind of like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. He's da, like da, da, the, da. he's like the da 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 of 
Bitcoin speakers. Da, 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 da. And so before we wrap up, I want to say, yeah, you know, check out our Telegram group, Orange Pill Pod. It is over there on or, on the Telegram, or it could be Orange Pill. <laughs> Follow the link below. And the thing is, like, we're organizing this group mass Zoom, which you will be filmed, so don't get, come on if you don't want to have your face filmed. But we're going to do a mass Zoom of of purchasing some of these solar cells at thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's Seeing cool. some trolls in real life, being trolled in real life, and um, of course having to probably bleep out some people or things. No, I think it's going to be a fun. <laughs> it's an orange pilled community, so it's there. There aren't too many. Um, you know, there's there's not going to be. It's all going to be positive. We're, My we're, arms are not too short to box with God. See you next week. Orange Pill Podcast. <laughs>